Okay, hey everybody, how you doing? Teching here. Um, that's really all I wanted to do today, but, uh, Barry, you got anything for me? Oh, that's cool, you got a little letter for me. That's nice. Uh, guess I'll answer my mail. You know, it's just rude to leave a letter next to, uh, me without opening it. I mean, my legal name is Teching101, after all. Oh, uh, let's see what we got. Oh. Guys! Finally, it's happening! After waiting for so long, I've finally been accepted into Baroque Works! I didn't even know this was a real organization! I just wrote that letter, I didn't think it was actually going to get returned! I am now Mr. Eleven, carrying on the mighty will of that random guy that was captured by Smoker and Tashigi and was later killed by the Billions. I will carry on his legacy proudly! <laughs> okay, um... But wait a second. Barry, how did you... Crocodile was defeated. How did you get the... Oh. Oh, okay. I think Barry picked up the pieces after Crocodile was defeated, guys. He's the new Mr. Zero. Okay, so, yes. Uh, Baroque Work video. Baroque Works video. Finally! It's been so long. I've been requested for this so many times. Uh, I included it on the list. Fun fact, this was the very first thing I included on the list, okay? So, yeah, a couple weeks ago, I was on vacation at an isolated mountain cabin, and I'm, like, sitting down one night, and I'm like, ah, oh, this is a nice, peaceful environment. I'm gonna draw up the list, you know, a list of, like, videos I want to do after I get back, after I, like, recharge my batteries a bit. And the very first thing that went on the list was... Baroque Works video. So here it is today. I made a lot of really cool graphics for it. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, but let's talk about how Baroque Works even started because Baroque Works is really interesting. It is the first big criminal organization that the Straw Hats have to go up against. Uh, of course, it's the first major organization they encounter upon arriving in the Grand Line. So it makes sense. Oda wanted to kind of mix things up. You know, in the uh, East Blue, they did have threats. You know, Don Krieg was threatening. I mean, not very, but he was. Arlong was very threatening with his crew, uh, but at the end of the day, they were just, like, pirate crews, and then you had Morgan, who was, like, a corrupt marine official, okay, uh, but then you get to the Grand Line, and it's been talked about all throughout the East Blue, you do not mess with the Grand Line, the Grand Line is the pirate graveyard, most ships that go there don't even make it there, they either smash against the, uh, Red Line, or Reverse Mountain, or there's a giant whale that sinks them or something, but even if you'd make it into the Grand Line, there's a bunch of different dangerous things, not the least of which being the weather, but there's also a lot of really strong pirates and groups out there in the Grand Line that kind of base their operations. Most of the vast majority of Devil Fruit users we see are in the Grand Line, so the way that Oda kind of introduces this is through Baroque Works, okay? This criminal organization led up by one of the seven warlords of the sea himself, Crocodile, or Mr. Zero. Um, you know, I'm not a huge fan of James Bond movies. I actually, I think I've only seen one. I think I've only seen Casino Royale. No, Skyfall. I saw Skyfall too. Skyfall was good. But I always compared uh, Mr. Zero or Crocodile to, like, a smooth Bond villain, you know, because he always gives that impression, you know, he dresses very smartly, kind of like Beige also, in a sense, kind of like a crime boss sort of uh, aesthetic, and, you know, we see uh, Crocodile plenty of times in the basement of his casino, he's got the giant aquarium with his banana wannies behind him, and he's just there swirling wine, and he's like, ah, Vivi, you've arrived back at your country attempting to kill me. Unfortunately, you do not know that I also prepared a giant crocodile ready to devour your friends. You know, that's kind of how he is. Uh, but no, looking into it, it's like, no, I think the real basis for Baroque Works and Crocodile's character, I think I think Oda really did go and look up, like, Bond villains and organizations, because there are references there that I didn't even realize until, like, just doing the research for this. So, of course, this whole thing starts with Crocodile, so we gotta talk about him. Of course, I've made plenty of videos about Crocodile before, but just to give you the rundown, kind of the abridged version here. <clears throat> All right. 24 years ago, Gold D. Roger is executed. A 22-year-old crocodile is present right there in the town square at Logtown. We don't get to see his face. We only get to see the back of his head, uh, witnessing the death of the Pirate King. Like all other, you know, pirates back then, you know, Doflamingo was there, Morio was there. A lot of people got inspired by the death of Gold D. Roger and his mighty call to go out into the sea, mateys, and find the One Piece! Become King of the Pirates! You know, and so Crocodile's like, yeah, damn straight, I'm gonna do that. 
and he does that, and he apparently did really well. He uh, uh, probably already had the Sunasuna powers at that point. He was already a Logia. He made huge waves in the Grand Line, made it all the way to the New World, uh, seemed to really be uh, pretty good at what he was doing, but um, right around the time he became a Warlord, and, and just the idea that his bounty was frozen, I believe, at 81 million kind of proves right then and there that he was a big threat, because the lower your bounty is when you get frozen and become a Warlord, that kind of indicates that, like, okay, you just start it off being a pirate and you probably only got like one or two major victories under your belt but the world government and the marines are like scared of you enough and your potential to make you a warlord to kind of like solve the problem or get them to or get them to work for the government before they become a serious threat right so that's probably what happened with crocodile uh kind of in a similar way to how boa hancock was like as soon as she became the empress of amazon lily they pretty much just like accepted her into their fold so probably something similar with crocodile crocodile was out there in the grand line probably did a bunch of, you know, attacked other pirate crews or the Marines or whatever, and he got a bounty of 81 million. That might have been his starting bounty. And he's like, you know what? He's pretty strong. He's got a Logia. He's got ambition. The, the kid's got drive. So let's just make him a warlord. So he got made into a warlord, and one of the first things Crocodile did upon becoming a warlord, and I think he definitely felt like, you know, he, he felt like, oh man, yeah, I'm awesome. I got, I'm a warlord. I got Logia powers. I'm in the new world. Let's take on Whitebeard. Yeah! Yeah. <laughs> okay, now, fair enough, Crocodile, fair enough. You're not the first person to come up with that idea, right? Um, Ace had the same idea. Ace, you know, he, he had Logia powers, too, and he went into the New World. What was Ace's main goal there? He's like, all right, well, who's the strongest pirate in the world? And that's probably going to be Edward Newgate. That's probably going to be Whitebeard. I'm like, all right, well, then we're killing Whitebeard. Ah, yeah, so Crocodile went up against Whitebeard, got the ever-loving crap beat out of him. That's probably where he got the scar on his face. That's probably how he lost his hand. Uh, we don't know, you know, certainly, but probably that's what happened. I, I'm imagining he went up to go fight against uh, Whitebeard, and Whitebeard just, like, grabbed his wrist like that, and Crocodile was like, oh, oh, this was a bad idea. Like, you think, son? Do you think? BAM! And then Crocodile just get hit so, got hit so hard by Whitebeard that Whitebeard was still holding on to his wrist and like, oh, well, I punched him so hard. Well, that's what happens. <laughs> Crocodile just gets sent flying away, you know, and he's like, okay, no. Now, I will say this about Crocodile. Most people, most people upon getting the ever-loving crap beaten out of them by a Yonko, not just a Yonko, but Whitebeard himself, would probably give up on their ambitions afterwards. Yeah. After Crocodile came to on another island like 20 miles away he was like oh all right i'm missing a hand okay maybe he would have been like you know what i don't think this whole king of the pirates thing i don't think it's for me i don't think i can do this i think i'm just gonna i think i'm just gonna hobble back to wherever i came from and just live out my life there a lesser a lesser pirate would have definitely probably have done that just tuck their tails between their legs and left crocodile did not crocodile was not deterred he's like you know what I still want to be King of the Pirates. I still want to make this work, but he's smart. He, maybe not smart. He was he was hot headed. He was young. He was younger. He was in his he was in his twenties back then. You know what I mean? So he was just like a little bit more hot headed. Like I'm gonna take down Whitebeard, and then ah, he got some reality pounded into him. Okay, and so at that point he's like, you know what? I am gonna try this again, but I'm gonna try this a little bit differently. Okay, and I can imagine Crocodile instead of directly going into the into the New World again because he's like, you know, not just Whitebeard, but there's also other Yonko too. There's there's Big Mom, there's Kaido, there's well, actually, Shanks just became a Yonko six years ago. So who was the who was the emperor before Shanks? Was there even an emperor before Shanks? Or was it just like the, the three emperors before that? that? That might be a topic for another video. But my point is, he knew that like, okay, not just Whitebeard, but there's other really strong pirates in the New World. Uh, and, and Crocodile was strong at this point. I'm not even saying like he was a weak person that fought against Whitebeard. It's just, it's Whitebeard. What do you think is going to happen, right? Okay, so Crocodile probably went and he hit the books and he's looking at the books, probably figuring out another way to uh, become King of the Pirates. Like there has to be another like angle to this or a shortcut and that's probably when he unearthed the um the discussions about maybe the uh, the ancient weapons and he learned about the ancient weapons specifically pluton this giant uh advanced battleship uh you know stronger than anything the uh, the pirates or the yonko or the marines or the world government could create uh, a ship with weaponry so devastating it could annihilate an entire country with a single shot a whole island could be sunk with the power of pluton alone so he's like all right we're going to find that. I'm going to find that thing, and I'm going to drive it right up to Whitebeard. And I'm just going to annihilate him, and then I'm going to move right along, and I'm going to find the One Piece, and I'm going to become King of the Pirates. However, 
this was the kind of thing you can't just do by yourself, okay? Crocodile was, uh, I believe, 30 years old when he set himself up at Alabasta, and uh, probably around that time is when Baroque Works came into fruition, when he set up his or organization. So, Baroque Works has probably been around, I'd say, the least amount of time it could be around is probably around 14 years, because he was 30 years old, uh, Crocodile was, when he arrived at Alabasta and started setting up his base at Rain Dinners and everything, and he was 44 years old when Luffy defeated him. That was two years ago, of course, from the time skip. He's 46 right now. So, that's 14 years right there, but Baroque Works might have, he might have started the operations before he got to Alabasta. Maybe he started to build it up a little bit. So yeah, that's the abridged version of it. I know that probably took a little bit longer than I intended, but hey, it's important that you know the past of all this and where Crocodile was, has really been and his journey to get to where this is. Okay, so Baroque Works has been around for at least 14 years, and it's the first serious threat the Straw Hats face in the Grand Line, more so than just like a ragtag pirate group they would run into in the East, like Buggy's crew, or even like Arlong's crew, which were pretty strong. This is a highly structured, regimented organization that works in the shadows, really good at deception, secret spies and all that, led by one of the seven warlords of the sea who is looking for an ancient weapon to rule the world. Okay, so this is some serious shit we're dealing with here. So now let's get into Baroque Works itself and the structure of the organization. And, uh, of course, if you're going to have a secret organization to begin with, especially a secret crime organization, you need to have cool code names. The code names better be sick and they better be lit. Some combination of the two would also be great. So, of course, the code names for Baroque Works are Numbers and Holidays. Crocodile knew where it was at. Crocodile knew where it was at. Okay. So, uh, Vivi actually explains this. If you want to go check out episode 91 of the anime, it's actually a pretty solid episode. It's the end of Drum Island. Chopper goes out to sea. And Vivi also kind of shakes down the whole setup for Baroque Works and how it goes down. All right. So, you got Mr. Zero, Crocodile, one of the warlords. He's at the very top. He's the uh, boss of the whole organization. Whatever he orders goes. Um, he keeps his identity, though, a secret from even uh, all the other officers. So, even like Mr one through five, who are the officer agents, when they arrived at rain dinners to meet the boss, they weren't even sure who it was going to be. They, they, like, their boss was kept a secret even from them. That kind of, you know, begs a question for me, like, how did Crocodile even build this organization up without even the highest operatives knowing who he was? You, you know what I mean? Like, so, Crocodile doesn't want them to know his identity, because that could also, because he's supposed to be a warlord. He's supposed to be working with the government. Here he is trying to overthrow the government with an ancient weapon, okay? So he has to keep his anonymity. All right, fair enough. But how did he recruit Daz Bones, or Bong Clay, or Gaudino, just from the shadows like did he literally just send out letters to like Daz Bones like Daz Bones got a letter in the mail and says you know I am a very strong uh, pirate and I have a Logia power and I'm setting up a criminal organization and I would like you to be the Mr. One of that organization and did Mr. One just like without any prompting or looking into who it was or how strong they really were or if any of this stuff was even legit Mr. One's just in the West Blue he was a, uh, a bounty hunter at this point he's just like yeah, sounds cool. I think it was the code names. I really do. I think it was the code names at the end of the day. Like, if you got a letter in the mail and it said, you will now be Mr. Four in this new organization I'm forming. Like, whoa, I get to have a code name. Cool. It's like code names Kids Next Door, right? It's just like, I'm number four. Awesome. Remember that episode of Codename Kids Next Door where number four is like in that like Dragon Ball Z parody? Okay, okay, I'm getting off topic. I'm getting off topic. Okay. So Crocodile's at the very top and somehow he forms the rest of this organization. Then we got Misters 1 through 5 uh, that are the officer agents of Baroque Works. I'm, I'm guessing Mr. Zero is also an officer too, but he's like the head of the whole organization. So Mr. 1 through Mr. 5 are officer agents. And then you got Mr. 6 through Mr. 12 who are the frontier agents. Um, and then you got Mr. 13 who's part of like the punishment squad or like the internal affairs, you know, division of this whole thing, okay? Each of these uh, teams have a male agent, you know, with the name of Mr. Zero, Mr. One, and then they have a female partner that uh, is named after a holiday. All with the exception of Mr. Two Bon Clay, because Mr. Two Bon Clay doesn't need a partner because he's Mr. Two Bon Clay! He's awesome enough. He can do it all on his own. So with that exception, though, you have 13 misters and you have 12 misses that comprise the uh, higher echelon of Baroque works. Uh, under them, they have foot soldiers that kind of do a lot of the heavy lifting and help because like, they have ships, of course. You need a lot of people to work with ships and stuff and other like bounty hunters working for them. Um, the foot soldiers that work under the officer agents are uh, 200 in number and they are called the billions. And then under the frontier agents, there's an 1800 additional ones that are the millions and they are like the weakest foot 
soldiers in the entire organization. So the way I guess this basically shakes down in terms of like promotions and stuff is that when you first join Baroque Works, you uh, are a member of the millions because those are the most numerous and they're the weakest. So you're foot soldiers for the uh, frontier agents. And then if you do really good and if you rise through the ranks and you prove that you're pretty strong and you're loyal to the organization, you are probably going to get promoted to the billions, which serve the officer agents, okay? And later on in the arc, it was actually explained that the billions are next in line to become the next frontier agents. Uh, one of the billions even mentioned that um, the billions are relative in strength to numbered agents of 10 and higher. So one of the billions actually uh, executed Mr. 11. And he's like, well, we're going to be next in line anyway. And you're Mr. 11 and we're billions. So we're basically, I mean, you might be a little stronger than us, but not much. So after you get promoted from billions, if there's an opening in the frontier agent next, and then you can rise through the ranks, I guess, even further and maybe even become an officer agent uh, if you really prove yourself. A good chunk of the officer agents and their partners all have devil fruit powers. Not every Every single one. Uh, Mr. Ford does not have a devil fruit. Miss Golden Week does not have a devil fruit. I think actually those are the only exceptions. I think every other member of the teams from Mr. 1 to Mr. 5, other than Miss Golden Week and Mr. 4, all have devil fruit powers. Um, and uh, yeah, Officer Agent is as high as you can get in the organization itself, but I guess only if there's like an opening in the slot, right? Okay. So that's how it basically uh, shakes down there. And so, uh, yeah, the uh, Officer Agents are, of course, given the most important jobs by Crocodile, and they're, you know, go out and really further his whole idea of finding Pluton or getting his hands on one of the Poneglyphs and deciphering that and figuring Figuring out where Pluton is, of course. Only the most important jobs are handled uh, by the officer agents. The frontier agents' main job is uh, fundraising, as VV put it. Their, their job is to fundraise, uh, gain money for the organization, which makes sense. If you're going to have a secret criminal organization, there kind of has to be a flow of money coming in. Also, recruitment, I would also assume, because it was Mr. Seven, who was a frontier agent, that tried to recruit Zoro all those years ago. So I guess it would make sense that they go out into the world. It's not just, we're led to believe at the beginning when the Straw Hats first encounter the Baroque works and everything, we, we led to believe that it's only the first half of Paradise, that like the entrance to the Grand Line where they're really active. And that makes sense. And Vivi even, Vivi even brings that up later. She's like, the Frontier agents basically set up shop at the beginning of the Grand Line to like trap, you know, uh, pirates, you know, pirates coming into like, do you think like Whiskey Peak was the only island that Baroque works controlled? Definitely not. Uh, Mr. Eight and Miss Monday and Mr. Nine and Miss Wednesday were the operatives that were based at uh, Whiskey Peak. But there were probably other islands, you know, because there's like seven islands you could go to depending on how you follow the log pose uh, that you can end up on. There were probably a few other islands that were led by like uh, frontier agents like Mr. Six. We never got to see Mr. Six or Miss Mother's Day, uh, Mr. Twelve and um, Miss Thursday, I believe, is the other pair that we just haven't gotten to see because they were probably stationed at one of those other islands or they were out in one of the blues. They were out in the East Blue or the South Blue or something just like Mr. Seven was trying to recruit other strong individuals from the blues into Baroque works. Okay, so that's their main job. And then finally, we have the Mr. 13 team, which is more of like the internal affairs punishment squad. We'll get to those, though. I'm just going to go down the line here. Okay, so uh, the first team we're going to focus on here is, of course, uh, the Zero team with Mr. Zero Crocodile and his partner, Miss All Sunday or Nico Robin, as we know her now. Not really sure if Crocodile would be considered an officer agent because he's the head of the whole organization, but basically he is. Okay, he's the highest authority there. Um, uh, we already know a lot about Crocodile, so I'm not going to go into more detail with that. We know his goals and everything. Uh, Miss All Sunday, or Robin, joined up with the organization six years ago. I'm not really sure if Crocodile had an assistant before Nico Robin joined up, but regardless, uh, she's the best assistant that he could really ask for because she has the ability to read Poneglyphs, and she was on the run from the government. Of course, we all know about Robin's backstory, um, and even with other pirate crews that she had joined throughout the years, they were always you know, attacked by the Marines and the world government because of her high bounty and her ability to read Poneglyphs, and she's one of the devils from O'Hara. Uh, Baroque Works ended up failing as well, but I have to say, while working for Baroque Works, it was the secret you know, clandestine operation, and even and Crocodile was like working secretly for the government while running it. So he had to make sure to keep all this stuff on the down low. So at least Robin for a good uh, four years there at least had a place where she could rest uh, safely. You know, it was part of a criminal organization. and She was an enemy of the Straw Hats when they first showed up. But at least the world government wasn't chasing her around. So it at least gave her some time to like uh, catch her breath, so to speak. Also, she's been interested in reading Poneglyphs. And Crocodile's goal was to find the Poneglyphs. So it's for, um, and she never intended to give Crocodile the location of Pluto 
Pluton anyway. But it's like, ah, okay, if I follow this, uh, if I follow this Mr. Zero crocodile around, uh, he might lead me to a Poneglyph, and that could make me get, get one step closer to the real Poneglyph. So Robin was kind of playing Crocodile the whole time. Crocodile finds out, tries to kill Nico Robin, but Luffy saves her, and then eventually ends up joining the Straw Hats. I think we all know a lot about these two individual characters. Although I would like to see Robin bust out the sexy um, cowgirl Miss All Sunday outfit again. Robin doesn't really bring that up too much in the story. I would love that. I like remember that scene like last chapter, not last chapter, but a few chapters ago where she, t you know, uh, knocks Big Mom over the side with Delphinium or something. That would have been awesome. It's like, whoa, Robin, you're so cool. And Robin's like, I was literally the number two of a criminal organization for four years. Damn straight, I'm badass. And I'm like, yeah, Robin, you are, you know? Okay. So that's, that's the Mr. Zero team, of course. Uh, Crocodile and Miss All Sunday, uh, with who talks like a Southern Bale in the four kids dub, of course. Moving on, we got the Mr. One team. We got Mr. One, Daz Bones, a bounty hunter from the West Blue, and his partner, Miss Doublefinger, or Zala, also known by her alias Paula when she was running the Spider Cafe, but her real name is Poison Spider Zala. We got a lot of the names of the officer agents and their partners in the Vivra cards if they weren't revealed in the actual story, okay? So, uh, a lot of them have themes, okay? Not every single team has a specific theme, but a lot of them do. And the theme of the Mr. One team is assassination, uh, because they were both, like, regarded as bounty hunters or, you know, assassins. And then also is, uh, like, like, a stabby, slicey kind of theme, because Mr. One has the Super Super Nomi, which allows him to turn any part of his body into steel blades. And Miss Doublefinger's ability is the Toge Toge Nomi, or the Spike Spike Fruit, that allows to create spikes anywhere on her bodies that she can use to like impale people and so yeah that makes sense why they would be uh right underneath crocodile as the strongest uh team on the entire crew now mr one of course probably the most prominent bounty hunter i would say in this entire story other than zoro himself because zoro used to be a bounty hunter before he became a pirate of course but other than that when i think a bounty hunter in one piece i think immediately of daz bones um and he's pretty cool i mean he really rose to notoriety while he was in the west and got recruited into baroque works and he was one of the most uh like probably up until that point in the story the toughest challenge for Zoro, because Zoro had to go through the whole thing of learning the voice of all things, learning observation hockey before observation hockey, and learning to slice through steel, which up until that point he could not do. And so he manages to finally overcome it, uses Lion's Song, and then slices down Mr. One. Um, of course, a lot of the officer agents show back up again in Impel Down. I really love that scene in Impel Down when Crocodile uh, was like going through uh, level four, and he's like, hey, I'm busting out of this joint. I'm going to need somebody that knows, you know, is pretty strong and knows what they're doing and then there's mr one hitting up cell and he's like well guess you could bust me out of this hell hole like quite literally it's level four and so he busts him out and uh after marine ford and everything mr one and mr uh, zero crocodile they go off into the new world together and like i said crocodile he's a smart guy so he tried the first time he tried to do this he was just like rushing into the new world got the crap beat out of him by Whitebeard. The second time he tried to do this was build up this really large, elaborate organization where he's a Bond villain and try to find the Pluton. That didn't work. He got beaten by Luffy. So the third time around, I think what Crocodile is going to do here, and I made a video about this, Crocodile's new plan, but I think what Crocodile is trying to do here, he's going to make a much more uh, insular kind of organization, like the best of the best of the best, not like, like, like 2,000 strong or anything like that, but have a few really strong, maybe other bounty hunters from the New World working for him, and he might try to, you know, ally with other teams or other organizations maybe in the revolutionaries to kind of get what he wants uh but he's gonna try this from a different angle this time he's definitely not going to just like jump into it or he's not going to build up a giant organization again all right and it's only been two years since he got freed from impel down so i don't think he has the time to really build up something that big again right because yeah things are kind of heating up in the world but that's mr one and then we have uh paula or zala and uh you know her thing is just spikes and she had a fight against nami which was really impressive nami busted out the climb attack in the first time she had a really a lot of really crazy ability where she can make like giant like mauls on her arm and you know like like giant spiky clubs and just attack Nami or she had like that doping ability where she can like you know um you know poke herself with her ability and just giant muscles just rip out of her and she's like ah I'm like okay damn all right um yeah so I really like their team and uh, the fight with Mr. One and Zoro is probably one of my favorite Zoro fights in the entire story okay so that's that's the Mr. One team then we get Mr. Two, Bon Clay, or Bentham is his real name. Like I said, he does not have a female partner because he is an Okama, so he kind of takes up the male and female uh, slots of the Mr. Two team in, in one uh, go there. Uh, he is, of course, an Okama. He is currently the queen of Nukama Land, uh, residing in Impel Down, level 5.5. Bon Clay lives on in our hearts. 
<sighs> and at first he was very sadistic. At first, like when we first see him, he's like beating the crap out of his navigator because they couldn't find Mr. Three because he was sent to go assassinate Mr. Three. Uh, a lot of the officer agents, whenever they are given a mission, is like, hey, Mr. Two, Mr. Three, uh, he was uh, defeated. You need to go eliminate him. Make sure he doesn't ask any questions. So that's the time. And even after uh, he arrived and he couldn't find Mr. Three, Mr. Two was worried that if he screwed up, then Mr. One would be sent after him. So that's kind of how the whole officer agent things goes. Uh, Mr. Two, of course, has the Mane Mane no Mi, or the clone clone fruit, allowing him to touch somebody's face, and then he can copy their body anytime he wants with his right hand and turn back with his left. Or it might be vice versa. I forget that exactly set up. But it all works out because he is redeemed big time at the end of the Alabasta arc when he helps the Straw Hats escape from Hina, and then once again helps them again when they get to Impel Down, and he has to give up himself and stay behind to fight against Magellan in one-on-one -on -one single combat when he is already bandaged up and beaten after being attacked by an army of wolves. He still stood his ground to make sure Luffy could save his brother, which Luffy failed to do anyway, but Mr. Two did it, damn it! He, he made it through. He survived, and he is currently uh, succeeding Ivankov's uh, position as the queen of New Kama Land. So, uh, Mr. Two lives on. I don't know if he'll ever show up again in the story. I think the only other time he might show up is if, let's say, the Revolutionary Army or somebody just attacks Impel Down and tries to free everybody in there. Because I know there's a lot of pirates in Impel Down, but there's also probably a lot of other people in Impel Down that are like revolutionaries or political prisoners that didn't get freed when Luffy tried uh, to free everybody. So, uh, maybe maybe Impel Down will get freed again, or maybe, maybe Mr. Two Bon Clay will lead the mass breakout again. He'll do another breakout, maybe when security's down or something. I don't know. I don't know. It might be tough. The security's probably definitely been bolstered since like 200 something prisoners broke out, but I hope to see Mr. Two Bon Clay again, and he's forever in our hearts, of course. Oh, come my way. Moving on to the Mr. Three team. We got Mr. Three Galdino, also known as Lone Shark Galdino, and his partner, Miss Golden Week, or Marianne, as her uh, actual name has been revealed in the Viva card. Uh, Mr. Three has the power of the wax wax fruit, and it was revealed uh, at their meeting when Mr. Zero was gathering everybody together that the officer agents are not necessarily ranked in terms of battle strength. He even mentions that Mr. Four is stronger than you, Mr. Three. I kept you around because of your ability, and also you were supposed to be really good at, like, like stealth operations and stuff like that and taking care of problems, but he failed at Little Garden because of Dory and Broggy and Luffy, you know, foiled his plans there. But uh, he has the power of the Wax Wax Fruit, being able to make wax sculptures. I did a video about that. He ended up in level two of Impel Down uh, and kind of became a uh, comic relief with Buggy, which... The two, I think, work really well together, and he is still a member of Buggy's crew to this day. Um, however, now that the Warlord system has been abolished, we don't really know where they're at right now. I'm sure, I'm sure Buggy would probably try to take his initial crew, like uh, Alvita and uh, Moji and Kabaji and Galdino and uh, and Richie, and just skip out and leave Kalibali Island and try to go somewhere else in the world. They might try to go up to Shanks to try to see if he could help them. I'm not really sure how this is going to go, but Galdino is still a member of Buggy's crew to this day. Okay, and then uh, Miss Golden Week. Um, uh, Marianne, a very interesting ability from her. She has the power of Colors Trap, which is not a Devil Fruit power. As she's one of the few officer agents that do not have Devil Fruit powers. Uh, she has the ability to draw these uh, different symbols on either the ground or people's uh, persons or whatever with her different colors paint. And depending on the color of paint, it affects them in a different way. So uh, red makes you raging mad, and blue makes you sad, and uh, bluish, I think blue green or greenish yellow was like friendship, you know? Uh, Black is betrayal, so you'll betray your friends. Yellow is laughter. And it's like some kind of hypnotism ability. I did a video about this as well. Um, but we still don't know to this day exactly how that power works. But there was an entire cover story based around Mrs. Golden Week's ability. Uh, and it was the uh, Miss, uh, Miss Golden Week's Meet Baroque, where she breaks out uh, all the other members of Baroque works except for Crocodile and Mr. One, as well as Mr. Three and Mr. Two. They all get sent to Impel Down to continue the story. Uh, but the other members, like uh, Mr. Four and Miss Merry Christmas and uh, Mr. Five and Miss Valentine uh, and Zala, Paula, they all escape and they set up a, a, a new uh, spider cafe in the middle of this desolate island in the middle of nowhere. And the end of that cover series is um, Miss Golden Week using her powers of rainbows to realize all of the dreams of the members of Baroque Works. So uh, they get to realize what. Well, so Mr. Miss Merry Christmas gets to be a princess and Mr. Four gets to be a pizza delivery guy. And we get to see the dream of Crocodile 
Kyle is still to become King of the Pirates. Mr. One wants to be a superhero. So, yeah, that's their dreams at the end of the day. So, Miss Golden Week, uh, very weird power for her, but uh, very interesting also. So, yeah, that was that team. And, oh, and in case you're curious, their theme was art, of course, because Mr. Three uh, Galdino can create wax sculptures, and then Marion, Miss Golden Week, paints them. So, there you go. Art is the theme. Moving on to Mr. Four and Miss Merry Christmas, or Miss Groundhog Day in the Four Kids dub, if you're just a fan of that. Uh, you know, Miss Merry Christmas real name is Drophy, and Mr. Four's real name is Babe, as in Babe Ruth, because the theme of Mr. Four's team is baseball, baby. So uh, he has this giant four-ton bat, and then Miss Merry Christmas turns into a mole, grabs the opponent, and just basically traps them underground, and then just rushes them right into the bat. You know, mole town cleanup hitter! And then smacks them right into the next county. Uh, Mr. Four is not the most intelligent human being in the One Piece world, uh, just an understatement, but he is still more intelligent, I'd say, than Geratsu, as in he doesn't forget to breathe sometimes so that's at least something you can give to mr four um their dynamic there is that mr four speaks very very slowly meanwhile miss merry christmas talks a mile a minute she talks like me pretty much hey everybody how you doing i'm miss merry christmas here here to talk about one piece there's a brick what's up with this brick why is this brick here seriously it's been like over a year that barry's been here and been my sidekick are you ever tired with the brick seriously does the brick have to be here every single time how you doing you know, so, uh, yeah, there you go. I, I guess I can also uh, voice act for Miss Merry Christmas or Pika or Orochi if, if, if it ever gets to that point. Right, okay, at least I can talk very, very fast. Um, I wasn't a really big fan of this pair. Uh, Chopper and Usopp have a really cool fight against them at Alabarna. But I'm not really a huge fan, honestly, uh, with, with the pair or anything like that. Um, as I said, Mr. Four's dream was to become a pizza delivery boy. And Miss Merry Christmas's dream was to become a princess. So that's nice. And now they're all working at the new Spider Cafe together. So that's that's lovely. Um, then we have Mr. Five and Miss Valentine. And uh, Mr. Five's real name is Jem. Full name is Jem of the Border. And then Miss Valentine, not Miss Valentine's Day, just Miss Valentine. Her name is Mikita. And uh, these are the first officer agents introduced in the story. They get introduced at Whiskey Peak. Uh, Mr. Five has the power of the bomb bomb fruit, which takes any part of his body, his hair, his skin, or his like boogers or his spit or whatever, his breath even into and turns it into an explosive. Uh, even his blood, I guess, if he wanted to like bleed on something, he can like cause that to explode. So very, very dangerous devil fruit there. And then Miss Valentine has the power of the Kilo Kilo Nomi, which is a downgraded version of Mach Vice's Ton Ton fruit. So she can change her body from one kilo all the way to a thousand kilos and she can like so she can like take her umbrella like mary poppins and float up into the air and then foo and then just turn into a thousand kilos or 100 kilos or whatever and crush the opponent underneath uh, her body there while her physical body doesn't actually change also she dresses like a lemon not really sure why but she dresses like a lemon also she had the voice of tails uh, the Fox, like Sonic's, like, sidekick in the 4Kids dub, like the same person that voiced Tails voiced her in the 4Kids dub, so that was, uh, let's get on with the shoe! I can't do that. I can't do that voice, but yeah. Um, so yeah, they show up at um, Whiskey Peak to actually try to bring in Igaram and Vivi because they found out that they were actually not members of Baroque Works. They were double agents working uh, in the organization. They were actually originally from Alabasta, and Vivi was the princess, of course. And so uh, Mr. Five and Miss Valentine show up for that. Luffy and Zoro one-shot them in that arc without it even really being a big deal. Uh, that was kind of funny, where it's like, these are the officer agents, these are supposed to be the highest level of the organization, and when Luffy and Zoro were just in the middle of their fight, they were in the way, and Luffy and Zoro just, BAM! SHING! And then just defeat them, and they get knocked out for the rest of the arc. Now, they show up again at Little Garden, of course. Uh, Mr. Five's got a really cool gun he got from the South Blue, I think, where he breathes into it and creates, like, those breath bullets. That was really cool. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah, like, in Whiskey Peak, it was just, like, Boob defeated. All right, were they officer agent? Well, whatever. You know, just move on forward and, uh, and upward, I guess. Uh, they were defeated properly at Little Garden, and they remained on the island. Uh, and they basically lived there like the Flintstones for a little while until Miss Merry Christmas. I'm uh, not Miss Merry Christmas. Miss Golden Week. I was gonna. I'm gonna confuse the names probably a boatload of times in this video. But uh, Miss Golden Week uses her powers to uh, take a pterodactyl and allow the pterodactyl to fly them and escape off of Little Garden to rescue the other members of the organization. So uh, yeah, they're they're still around as well, Mister. Five dream was to become a uh, firefighter, which is kind of ironic because he literally starts fires. And Miss Valentine's dream was to become a chocolate lady. So the joke there is she dresses like a lemon, which are very sour, but she wants to be the chocolate lady, which 
is very sweet. I, I don't know. I guess you could just change an outfit. I don't why do you even need the, the colors thing for that? You could just like, you know, change your outfit. If you if you want to serve chocolate instead of lemons, then just serve chocolate, lady. I don't know what else you want me to tell you, right? Like exactly. Oh yeah, by the way, I also forgot about Lasso. Lasso was the uh gun dog companion of Mr. Four and uh Miss Merry Christmas. It was a gun that consumed uh the um Dobson Devil Fruit dog model and became a dog. So um yeah. That's, uh, that's, that's Lasso. I hope you, uh, yeah, like him. Yeah, he's a very good doggo. Okay, so, uh, he's a tank now. He's a tank dog. Yeah. Okay, so those are the officer agents, and each of those officer agents went up against one of those, like, Mr. One went up against Zoro, Mr. Two went up against Sanji and everybody. Now we get into the frontier agents, and the frontier agents, there's a few of them we've never seen and never been mentioned before. There's another few that are just mentioned in, like, drawings or sketch art that Oda has revealed to us. Uh, first and foremost, we have Mr. Six and his partner, Miss Mother's Day. We do not know anything about these characters. They have never been mentioned, nor have a sketch of them ever been revealed. So that's pretty much there. I'm assuming they were probably agents in other locations in the Grand Line at the start of the Grand Line at other islands, or they were out in one of the Blues trying to recruit members for the organization. Um... I, I like to think that when they were, like, they were somewhere off of, they, they weren't in Alabasta, obviously, they were some other island, and they get the newspaper, and they find out that Crocodile has been defeated, and, like, Crocodile has been ousted as, this was a secret member of the, uh, he was actually the leader of this criminal organization, Crocodile, he played the whole world government, and he's being, you know, d dishonored from the warlords, and he's being thrown and impaled down. If, if you were Mr. Six, or Miss Mother's Day in that instance, and you're on some random island reading the paper, you're like, oh, shit. Uh, well, the boss, apparently, well, we found out who the boss of the organization was, uh, it's Crocodile, and he was defeated by a rubber boy at Alabasta. Actually, the Marines reported it that Smoker defeated him. So, oh, yeah, uh, Smoker defeated him. Okay, well, I guess we're out of work. I would just play it off, right? I'd just be like, all right, well, uh, guess we're just gonna pack up our things and go. Uh, Mr. Six, because a lot of the, uh, members of Baroque Works have, like, a tattoo of their number on them somewhere. Not every single one. It's not like the Espada or anything. Um, Mr. Five had a tattoo on his arm of the five. Uh, Mr. Four just wore a big shirt that had a four on it. Mr. Three had his hair. Uh, and Mr. One, I think, also had a tattoo in, in, with number one on his chest. But not every single one had to. It wasn't, like, a requirement. But if I was Mr. Six in that instance, I'd be like, okay, I'm just gonna get this six lasered off tomorrow and just just get out of here now miss mother's day we gotta go we gotta go right and if just just go back into the private sector and like nobody ever needs to know you managed to get a, a get out of jail free card in this one instance uh then we have mr seven the second mr seven because as we stated zoro killed the first mr seven and uh his partner miss father's day uh they are the sniping uh theme because whenever you need a, a sniping job done in baroque works i guess you call mr seven and miss father's day because they look capable in that regard they don't use sniper rifles though they just use regular pistols that they have so okay whatever. Uh, and they were introduced very late into the arc. They were basically introduced, they were the last agents of Baroque Works to be properly introduced, and they were introduced guarding the giant bomb that in the clock tower that Crocodile was going to detonate and destroy all of Alubarna. Alright, so they were there to like use sniping to like keep people away, but also to kind of just guard the uh, the weapon itself. Uh, Mr. Seven dresses like a king from like a, a deck of playing cards, and he has sevens, like the kanji for seven drawn all over his shirt. Uh, he has like sevens for eyebrows. Uh, so he dresses like a king, and and Miss Father's Day dresses, like, the theme of Miss Father's Day, I don't get at all. So, she's a sniper, she represents Father's Day, but she dresses like a frog. She has, like, frog stuff all over her body, and I get it, I get it, just because you are, like, just because, um, you know, uh, uh, Zala was Miss Doublefinger, by the way, the double finger means New Year's, because, you know, 1-1, one, one, January 1st, you know, first month, first day, so that's like a Japanese, like, you know, reference or whatever, but just because Zala was Miss New Year's, that doesn't mean she had to be walking around with, like, a, a New Year's cap on, or, like, the hats you get, or, like, the glasses or anything, or use fireworks for weapons, just because she was named after her agent number means New Year's, right? Uh, Miss Merry Christmas kind of went the furthest with that, and Miss Merry Christmas Christmas wore a tie that was like a Christmas tree. Uh, Miss Golden Week. Golden Week is just a festival in Japan, and Mr. Two Bon Clay is like the, the Obon festival in Japan as well, but I don't think they dressed as anything indicative of their holidays or anything. Um, so I understand Father's Day is a difficult theme to dress up. Maybe like wear a tie or something, because it's like, hey, here, Dad, have a tie. Am I the only one that just gives... I don't, I don't give my dad. My dad doesn't wear ties, but, you know, when I worked at the dollar store for Father's Day, we'd have like a Father's Day section, and it would mostly just be coffee mugs and ties that's like that's all you're gonna get your 
dad for for uh, Father's Day. Just coffee mugs or ties or like little tool kits or whatever. Um, but anyway, yeah, frogs. So maybe she's a fan of uh, Froppy from My Hero Academia before My Hero Academia was even a thing. But that's Mr. Seven and Miss Father's Day. And they were actually defeated by Vivi. Vivi actually took out her peacock slashers and she uh, cut them both down there. And I don't think they're dead, but they were defeated and probably handed over to the Marines afterwards. Then we get to Mr. Eight, who is actually Igaram, who you was also using the cover identity of Igarapoi, and uh, his partner, Miss Monday, who were stationed at uh, Whiskey Peak. And their theme is deception, because uh, you gotta love Igaram. Igaram was like triple cover, okay? Because he was actually a member of the Alabasta Guard named Igaram, but then he was working undercover as Mr. Eight of Baroque Works, uh, but then he was working as also a cover as Igarapoi, the mayor of Whiskey Peak. So he was like triple covered. Mr. Mister Eight Igaram, man, he, he had acting skills, right? And so um, their theme is deception because he hides like the little machine guns in his hair and he pretends to be really nice, but he's actually, you know, a secret agent spy, but he actually isn't. So the deception angle really goes far on that end. And then we have Mr. Eight's uh, partner, Miss Monday, uh, who's this really burly woman uh, that dresses up like a nun when they first arrived at Whiskey Peak to kind of lull them into a false sense of security. Like, oh, I am just an extremely muscular nun. Nothing to see here. And then they have a drinking competition and you know, to lull the pirates into a false sense of security. Uh, she takes off the uh, nun clothes and, you know, she's complaining to Mr. Eight, like, man, those pirates ate all that food, you know, and now how are we going to replenish supplies and everything, you know, whatever. And then the fight is on where Zoro just slices down a hundred bounty hunters at Whiskey Peak, and then after that goes up against Miss Monday, and Miss Monday has, uh, she doesn't have a devil fruit or anything, her main ability is just her ridiculously powerful, like, superhuman strength, okay, and she has brass knuckles she puts on, and she's like, superhuman brass knuckles, and just tries to crush Zoro, and, but it doesn't work, like, she literally takes out her fist and just, BAM, slams it right into Zoro's face, and, like, cracks the building that they're standing on, but Zoro's just like, that all you got? And Miss Monday's like, oh, and then Zoro just grabs Miss Monday's head and just, like, crushes it like a vice. And then she's just there like, ah! And then she just loses consciousness. Just to prove how much stronger Zoro is. And Miss Monday it was jacked, you know? Like, she's she's really buff, but Zoro, man, just, just stronger, you know? So it really proved right there, just, like, when it comes to, like, the front... Uh, probably another reason we didn't get to see, like, who Mr. Six really was or anything is, like, it wouldn't have mattered. You know, like, did you see how strong... Like, like I said, Luffy and Zoro one-shotted officer agents without even really knowing they did it, you know what I mean? Like, so, like, Oda did not have to introduce Mr. Six or Mr. Twelve or Mr. Ten or all the different members we didn't get to see. It wouldn't have mattered. They wouldn't have posed a threat, you know what I mean? Uh, you see how easily Zoro took out Miss Monday there, so, uh, Zoro takes, uh, her out and then continues on with the fight. Uh, we do get to see Miss Monday, uh, in the cover series, um, uh, The Decks of the World after the time skip. She's still living there with, uh, Mr. Nine at Whiskey Peak, and they actually have a kid now, and uh, her design is a little bit different. Uh, Oda, you know, drew her with longer hair after the time skip, but also she's she's a lot less buff. Like she's still muscular, but she's um not like 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 bodybuilder muscular. Now she's just more like really fit. Um, and so that's her new design. And then Mr. Nine's there, and they got together and they have a baby now. So that's that's adorable. That's nice. Um, even though Mr. Eight was you know a secret agent actually working for uh, Alabasta this whole time, Miss Monday never found out about that. And then we get to the next team, Mr. Nine and uh, Miss Wednesday who is, of course, Vivi Nefeltari, Princess of Alabasta. Uh, their theme is uh, royalty, okay? Because it's kind of like a double ironic thing here because Mr. Nine dresses up like a king, even though he's not really a king. He's like, I'm not a king or a prince or anything. It's just, this is like a Burger King crown. I'm just doing it for an aesthetic. I thought it would be cool. I'd be, I'm a king, you know, whatever. Everybody needs a theme to live by, right? But it turns out, it's funny, because Miss Wednesday actually turns out to be Vivi, who is an actual princess. So that's how that actually ended up. And uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail about Vivi, because we know all about her. I did a whole video about Vivi. Um, but suffice it to say, you know, Vivi is an awesome character. And, and she was also a really good actress here because she figured out how to, like, seep in. And she even went along with Mr. Nine because Mr. Nine was kind of, like, talking in the... Kind of talks like, hey there, baby, let's go do this and bring in this giant whale for the town. Yeah, baby. You know, so Vivi was good with that kind of style or whatever. And she was pretty strong. She learned how to use the peacock slashers. Karu is also, of course, a member of this team as well. Um, but, of course, we find out the, the uh, reveal at Whiskey Peak that she's really a princess. And I like the way... 
Mr. Nine acts. Mr. Nine fights with uh, baseballs, baseball bats, I guess baseballs as well, but he uses baseball bats to fight, uh, kind of like Mr. Four, uh, except his baseball bats are not four tons, and they also have, like, little chains in them, so he can kind of push a button and fire out the end of the bat and, like, grapple around somebody and, like, pull them down uh, or, you know, attack them that way or something. But I really like whenever it was discovered by Mr. Five, he's like, hey, you know, Vivi Nefertari is actually Miss Wednesday. She's a double agent. We need to eliminate her now. Mr. Nine actually cared about her and actually protected her and was like, hey, um, you know, you guys get going. I'll hold them off as long as I can. And it, and it was like Mr. Nine is like more of a decent human being where he's like, he's a member of a criminal organization and he definitely has the blood of some people on his hands and on his back. But he's like, you know, you were my partner, you know, not like in a romantic sense or anything. I don't think Mr. Nine had for Vivi, but it's just like, I, um, you know, you were my partner. We worked together and uh, you're a really good person. And I don't think, you know, just because you betrayed the organization, I, my, I, I care more about your well-being than I care about this organization. So get out of here, get to safety. I'll hold them off as long as I can. I don't know how long I'll be able to, but I'm here to protect you. You know, just, just for the sake of being a decent human being. And I was like, I am loyal to Baroque works. You're a, you're a double agent. I will eliminate you post haste. Like, so he was kind of a decent human being. And then, uh, you know, he stays on Whiskey Peak afterwards with Miss Monday. They get together and they have a child. Okay, so now we move on to Mr. Ten and his partner, uh, Miss Tuesday. Apologize for the blurry sketch art here. I'll, I'll show it to you now, like a little bit smaller so you can kind of see them a little bit better. Uh, so this is unfortunately all the artwork we get for them, which is more than like Mr. Six. We got Mr. Ten and we got Miss Tuesday. Other than their designs, we know nothing about them. Uh, Mr. Ten seems to be just the guy that wears a Hawaiian shirt. So it's like, yeah, I wore a Hawaiian shirt before Frankie made it cool so he's just like a guy I uh, don't know how he fights or anything and then there's Miss Tuesday that's wearing some kind of elaborate dress with like a hood that has like things poking out of it I thought it was a peacock I thought it was supposed to be like the hood representing a bird with like the plumage of like a peacock um, I guess you could say Vivi's thing was a peacock because of the peacock slashers. But hey, Mr. Four and Mr. Nine both use baseball bats as weapons, so you can double up. It's fine. Um, and that's all we know about them. Like I said, they were probably out recruiting. The fact that Oda did do sketch art of them and never revealed sketch art for Mr. Six or Miss Mother's Day or the Mr. Twelve team makes me think that he maybe did have an idea for Mr. Ten and Miss Tuesday at some point. Like there was going to be some time at the story he was going to maybe use them. So they got up to the design phase, but never really got beyond that. Never needed to use them so i don't know maybe mr uh maybe mr 10 used uh axes as a weapon he throws throwing axes as a weapon and miss uh miss tuesday uses the peacock bow i i don't know man i'm just throwing a crossbow or something i'm just throwing this out there all right uh, then we get Mr. Eleven and his partner, Miss Thursday. Uh, Mr. Eleven, we do get to see. He was actually captured by Smoker and Tashigi en route to Alabasta. Uh, he was captured. He used a sword in combat, Kashu, which was actually one of the uh, Rio Wazamono, one of the ones that Tashigi actually claimed for herself and, like, you know, rescued, because that's, like, Tashigi's whole thing. So he was tied up on Smoker's marine vessel, and Smoker actually used, like, deception and interrogation to actually get him to spill the beans on some stuff where he basically goes up to Mr. Eleven and is like, all right, listen, we already read the note that was in your pocket. We know all about your organization, so you might as well just spill the beans. And he's like, what? What do you know about Mr. Zero? Damn it, I thought I burned that letter. And Mr. And Smoker's just like, yeah, we found no letter. I was just messing with you. And Mr. Eleven's like, ah, damn it. And so uh, Mr. Eleven was tied to the ship for a while, but when they arrived at Alabasta, Smoker and Tashigi and the rest of the Marines left, and the ship was actually found by members of the Billions. Remember, the Billions are the foot soldiers that work underneath the officer agents, and that's when we see one of the one of the Billions. His name was actually Mr. Mello, because uh, I guess the Billions have Mr. Names as well. But he's like, uh, hey, yeah, Billions and, you know, officer, uh, not officer, but uh, the frontier agents that are ranked 10 and higher, and you're Mr. 11, we're basically the same uh, power level, and uh, to use a Dragon Ball Z term, and if I kill you here, then there's an opening, and then I might get your position as Mr. 11, and so uh, Mr. 11 is dead, he, he dies, it isn't directly shown, but yeah, Mr. Mello, one of the Billions, just basically shoots him as he's tied up, and he couldn't go anywhere, he couldn't defend himself, so he probably died, but Baroque Works became defunct afterwards anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, and Miss Thursday, we don't know. We're, we're assuming Miss Thursday, maybe Mr. Eleven was like about to be captured by Smoker, and he's like, Miss Thursday, you gotta get out of here. And maybe he's like, he took a letter or something. He's like, here, get to Alabasta, give this to the boss, let them know what happened to me. You shall avenge me, for I am Mr. Eleven! Bring it on, Smoker! And then, like, Tashigi shows up and fights him and, you know, wins. And Miss Thursday probably get, got away. And once again, the same thing with Mr. Six and Miss uh, Mother's Day. It's like, hey, you've probably found out later that Crocodile was defeated, just like, whoop! 
okay, well, I guess that's it. And then just Miss Thursday just walks away free and clear, and that's it. Uh, moving on to the Mr. 12 and the Miss uh, Thur uh, Saturday team. Uh, yeah, I know the days of the weeks are kind of, like, thrown out of whack here. So we have the holidays, and then we had Miss... Uh, Miss Mother's Day and Miss uh, Father's Day to kind of fill out the gap there. But then we go Mr. 8 and Miss Monday, Mr. 9 and Miss Wednesday, skipping Tuesday. We got Mr. 10 and Miss Tuesday, and then Thursday, and then skipping Friday to Saturday. So whatever. But yeah, Mr. 12 and Miss Saturday, no, literally nothing about them. But because I, I just feel like doing this, I'm going to make up uh, off the top of my head headcanon for Mr. 12 and Miss Saturday. I think they started a bakery. Here's what happened. Okay, they were probably stationed, I'm going to say, somewhere in the South Blue. And they were recruiting for Baroque Works. They're like going around the South Blue like, hey, would you like to join? You look pretty strong. Would you like to join the prestigious Baroque Works organization? We have a great health plan. Uh, we pay, you know, we, we pay for your college for you. You know, you come to go to school where like reasonable rates and like hours and everything you know you look pretty strong you could be uh joined become one of the millions today and so they're in the south blue they're working together i like to think they're just kind of like they weren't really mean i like to think because we know nothing about them so you can make your own head cannon but they were just like you know they were pretty low on the, the totem pole here actually they were probably the lowest in terms of that because mr 13 and miss friday there's something different they're like the internal affairs punishment force they're not part of like regular frontier duties okay so in terms of just like the frontier agents that are weaker than the officer agents and at the very bottom of that you got mr 12 and miss saturday and they were probably just like maybe right out of college or whatever and they're like okay well we're part of baroque works now and then they get the orders from above and they're like hey just go out there into the blues and try to recruit people into baroque works try to earn money for the organization like okay cool we'll do that come on miss saturday oh this sounds like fun we have code names i know and they go around and they're just like man we can't get anybody to recruit this is just Man, this just ruffles my, my, my britches, I guess. I don't know. This ruffles my britches, Miss Saturday. We can't get anybody to join. I know. Let's put on a, uh, let's put on a show in the middle of town to get people, like a comedy show to get people to recruit to Baroque Works. Like, they were coming up with stuff like that, right? They were, like, kind of lame, but also part of this organization. And then finally, they get the paper when Crocodile was defeated. Like, oh, oh. Mr. Uh, Zero is actually Crocodile. He's one of the warlords, and he's defeated, and he's going to the throne in jail now, and the whole organization is basically crumbled apart. Uh, everyone else is, like, captured. Like, Mr. One is captured, and Mr. Two, and, like, oh, they're all going to impel down. I'm like, oh! And so I like to think they were not part of the organization for long, maybe only a few months, and uh, they weren't really great at their jobs, but then they they basically got off the hook, and they're like, oh, okay, well, I guess that didn't work out. I guess uh, guess we gotta go get real jobs now, and then they leave, and then that's it. So that's that's the start. They went and they started a bakery. They started a bakery, and they served delicious donuts to people. Uh, Kata Curry is one of his favorite places to go whenever he's traveling around the South Blue. Kata Curry stops over at their bakery to pick up some delicious donuts, um, and that was that's the story of uh, Mr. 12 and Miss Sal. Saturday. Uh, if you want to make a story for Mr. Six or like Miss uh, Mother's Day or even Mr. Twelve and Miss Saturday, if you like, like what's up with them, there you go. Have fun. Or what happened to Miss Thursday? You know, what happened to Mr. Eleven's partner? And then we round this out with uh, the last team, Mr. Thirteen, who is in fact an otter. Uh, wearing a, a pajama onesie for some reason, and then Miss Friday, who is a vulture with a Gatling gun strapped to her back. So yeah. Yeah, that's a thing. Um, they are, like I said, Eternal Affairs Execution Squad. Basically, they're uh, they're there to make sure all of the other Frontier agents are doing their thing. Um, I guess the officer agents kind of police themselves because when Mr. 3 failed, they sent Mr. 2 to assassinate him. But the Frontier agents are kind of all over, kind of scattered all over Paradise and the Blues. So uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. 13 can, of course, swim, and Miss Friday can, of course, fly. So they would fly to where they go, and in some situations, they would just like sketch if, they, if the opponents are too strong for them they would just sketch like the artwork and then leave and report back to the boss and then just be like oh okay here are the enemies that need to be eliminated um but uh, they can also take care of the annihilation as well uh the execution because of the uh, giant gatling gun on miss friday's back also mr 13 miss friday they are also referred to as the unluckies friday the 13th so that's the reason why the days of the week are kind of messed up still it, it doesn't explain why vv had to be miss wednesday it should have went Miss Monday, and then Vivi should have been Miss Tuesday, and then Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday, and then Friday, if you wanted to do that. So I'm not, I'm not sure. Maybe Oda just really liked, I don't want Vivi to be a Tuesday. She's a Wednesday. 
which makes sense. I feel like Tuesday is the worst day of the week, or at least I used to think that when I was, like, in school, because it's like, yeah, Mondays suck because, you know, it's the first day back after the weekend and everything, and you're tired. But then when you wake up on Tuesday, you're like, ah, oh, all that stuff I did yesterday on that Monday, I got four more days of that crap. <laughs> I got four more days. Barely made a dent. Not even halfway done yet. <sighs> so I always hated Tuesdays the most. But anyway, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, Miss 13 and Miss Friday. They were actually uh, almost... I thought they were killed by Sanji. Because Sanji, like, 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 fights them at Little Garden. Literally grabs Miss Friday between his legs. And then... <laughs> cracks the vulture's neck and it just drops you know and also hurts mr 13 as well so i thought sanji just straight up killed them but no they're alive and it turns out the marines actually captured them and the marines are using them now as basically like hostages and to sketch art like like uh, known criminals so they're basically the sketch artists that are I, they might very well still be working for the marines because they basically like hey we'll feed you if you sketch the other members of baroque works for us so we know who we're dealing with here and so they might be still working for the marines as sketch artists for other you know, really well-known pirates or like revolutionaries or something. So who knows? We might actually get to see the unluckies again because they are still alive and they might be useful. And they're, they're out of work now. So the Marines might be like, hey, you guys are really good at uh, gathering intelligence and you're really good at uh, sketching artwork. So tell you what, work for the Marines and uh, just travel around and find out what's going on. And then, you know, find out the revolutionaries and sketch their appearances and let's see what's going on here. So I could actually see the unluckies popping up again. But as for pretty much everybody else, um, aside from like Mr. Two, who is an ally now and obviously like Mr. One, who's currently working with Crocodile, uh, Mr. Three, who's now part of Buggy's crew. I don't see them ever, other ones. Them, uh, I don't see the other ones showing up. I don't see like Mr. Five showing back up again or, or, or I do, wow, we actually do find out who Mr. 12 was this whole time. Like that would be so weird, man. I'll tell you what, it's already a long video, but that would be so weird if at some point in the story, the Straw Hats are traveling and they encounter some random person and they're like, oh, I used to be Mr. Six, part of Baroque Works. I'm like, oh, okay. You know, like, all right, I, I, that's something I never thought would be revealed, but okay, that's, that's something. Oda does like to bring stuff back that he hasn't touched upon in years and years and years. So who knows? May maybe it will. Maybe it'll be just some off-the-cuff thing where it gets brought up. Who knows? Maybe, actually, you know, there is one way I think it could be brought back. And it's not the bakery thing. It's not the bakery thing. I mean, even in this say, even in this case, it would probably be better just to use another officer agent. But anyway, um, let's say Crocodile does revive Baroque Works at some point, but it's a much more like a limited, like it's only like five or six members, like the strong of the strong in Baroque Works, right? He makes like Baroque Works too, or he write about, he just uses this. It was his trademark. He's the one that came up with the damn logo, right? So he does that, right? And um, let's say it's in the paper, Baroque Works is resurfaced again. Um, except this time, it's not like a secret organization. Like, like everybody knows it's Crocodile. Crocodile is already well known as a pirate that's active in the New World. He's freed from Impel Down. They know he's out there doing stuff. So Crocodile is not even going to do with the pretenses. He's like, yes, I'm back and I'm I'm running Baroque Works again. We could maybe cut to a random scene somewhere in the Blues or in the Grand Line where we see an individual reading the newspaper and being like, so Baroque Works is back. And then we get the title card, like, former Mr. Six, former Miss Mother's Day, or whatever, and be like, oh, so the organization is starting back up again. Maybe we should join. And just a, just a cameo, just to see them. But even with that, I could see, like, it would be better if, like, it was one of the ones that are at the Spider Cafe. Like, if Zala was reading the paper, and she's like, oh, so the boss is starting it up again. Maybe we should go back, or should we stay here where our dreams come true? And, you know, it's like, no, like, Miss Miss uh, Merry Christmas is like, screw that, I'm a princess here, I'm staying here, I'm not joining them again, screw that. It's like, okay. So it, it would probably be something like that, where they, we wouldn't see Mr. Six or any random person. It would be probably the Spider Cafe, where we touch uh, base with everybody that would be there. But anyway, this is already a really long video. Uh, this is over an hour. I mean, once I edit it down, it's going to be shorter than that probably. But damn, hope you guys enjoyed this. This has been a long time coming. Uh, and we only have two videos of the list left. One of them is another Devil Fruit discussion. It's not going to be a very long video. So that'll be like the calm before the final video, which will definitely make you cry. Thanks for watching, everybody. This will be Teching signing out.